Welcome back to the Pylon Cam Podcast. I am your host, Mike, and welcome to episode 13 of the podcast. Got, as always, we got a lot of stuff to go through today. We got a great show for you, um, and we got just a lot of interesting football to talk about. There's a lot, a lot of rumors, a lot of buzz around the league. But before we get into the episode for today, um, I just want to bring this up if nobody hasn't heard yet. Uh, uh, Demarius Thomas, former wide receiver for the Denver Broncos, has passed away suddenly. Um, and it's just sad. It's just really sad that someone who, you know, I grew up watching, someone I've seen play for a very long time, he was one of the first names that I knew about, you know, when I really started watching football. Like, Demarius, you'd always hear about Demarius Thomas. And, you know, Peyton Manning had this quote that just, I'm going to quote it, DT was a better person than he was a player, and he was a Hall of Fame player. That tells you how good of a person he was. And as I've been seeing, you know, on Instagram, on Twitter, all of all of Demarius's life off of the field, it, you know, life is short. Life is, um, it's precious. It's, and it just is so fragile. Um, I just wanted to, to start the video with this because I didn't want to, you know, I obviously want to pay respect to someone who, you know, we talk a lot about fantasy football on this on this channel. We talk a lot about football, obviously, on this channel. But Demarius Thomas was someone I grew up watching. He was one of the first players I had in fantasy football, my fantasy football teams. Um, it's just sad. It's just really sad that someone so young, someone so, you know, amazing off the field, very involved with helping kids, very involved with schools, um, just gone. Just gone just like that. Uh, it sucks. You know, it's not like he was in a gang or he was, you know, being an idiot off the field. He was one of the good ones. So you hate, you just hate when stuff like this happens. You hate when it, when, you know, you just hate it. It's just, it, and it's just sobering. It's just really sobering. Like, you know, every day, Tell your mom you love her. Tell your dad you love him. Tell your wife you love her. Tell your family you're thinking about them. Um, just don't. Just don't. I don't know, man. It's too precious. Things happen too fast. People, people, um, people think they're invincible. Not that he did anything wrong. I'm just saying, you know. Just because you're young, just because you know you're, you think that tomorrow is guaranteed, it's not. It's not. So make sure you tell your loved ones you love them. Make sure you, you know, check in on everybody. Make sure they're doing all right. Because uh, you don't know what can happen tomorrow. You don't know who's going to be here and who's going to be gone. Uh, but anyway, I know it's kind of sucks to start the episode off with kind of a sobering, sobering topic, I guess, but. I just wanted to make sure I paid my respects and, you know, let my listeners know, like, if you're going to follow this channel, like, this stuff is important, and I'm going to not shy away from things that I think are important because they might not generate the most clicks or they might not generate the most buzz, but, like, this stuff is important to me, and using the, like, I have a platform, whether it's big or small, to tell you guys that would listen that, you know, be, you know, be a good person, do the right things, be better than the, you know, don't ego or pride your, like, be prideful, but try to be the best version you could be of yourself and try to make sure that you use that to help other people and support other people and make a change. Like, I know that that goes a lot. People say make a change, but, like, what do they mean by that? When I'm telling someone to make a change, like, make someone's life better. Don't do it because you want to be... Like, I'm not telling you this because I don't want someone to go like, oh, my God, did you hear that podcast? Like, no, like, do it because it's the right thing to do. It's the right way to live your life. Um, but, you know, just wanted to say this. Just wanted to make sure it was heard. Uh, but with all that being said, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a good episode. It's going to go up from here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, let's talk about the first story. Uh, let's talk about the first story of the week. Um that I think has just been the hottest story of the week, being that there was news released about it. There was, 
this person came out and said, oh, I'd like to go here. I'd like to get traded here. I'll waive my trade clause for these three teams. And if you can put that together, we are about to talk about where Russell Wilson will play in 2022. So how I thought about talking through this is we're going to weed out by process of elimination, but I'm going to give a, a very good example of where I think Russell Wilson is at in his career and why a few of the teams he mentioned might be smoke and mirrors and where I think he will eventually go, inevitably. And I just want to start with a player that, you know, we all we all know a lot about, but I'm not going to name his name um, for a second. I just want to tell a little bit about his story, a little bit about his upbringing, a little bit about his childhood. No, I'm just kidding. But we are going to talk about when this player – made a huge decision for his career, and I am talking about LeBron James going to Miami. No, I'm just kidding. But th- this is what I want to say, because I-, I did some digging on this, and I really, th- with some of the teams that Russell Wilson mentioned, I was like, what? Like, wh- why would you ever want to go play there, especially with the, you know, your biggest issues with your s- current situation? So let's, t- let's talk about the guy I'm talking about, all right? So, this player, you know, franchise guy, franchise QB, and he was transitioning from another team, you know. What do you think he was looking for in the new team? Well, let's start top to bottom, right? Head coach, 73-71 and 71 record in Carolina. Carolina was the first team he ever head coached. They went to the Super Bowl in 2003. They went to the NFC Championship in 2005. They went to the playoffs in 2008. And then, this might give away who the player I'm talking about is, then this coach went to Denver. His final record, when it was said and done in Denver, was 46-18. and 18. This player in 2000, this coach in 2011, their team finished 8-8. Eight and eight. Okay? Then, you know, they... Do some, they do some stuff, you know. They go out and they get, they do some, they do some shopping in the off season, and they're saying, you know what? Excuse me. We're missing a QB. You know, I think if we have a QB, we can make something of this team. We can, we can make make some noise in our division. We can make some noise in the AFC West. After they acquire said player, they go thirteen and three with Peyton Manning, right? One of the biggest free agency moves in the NFL history. Peyton Manning leaving the Colts after neck surgery. They draft Andrew Luck, his successor, and it was a it was a mutual split. You know, the two teams. You say you say, hey, Peyton, we love you. Thank you for all you've done, but uh, we're gonna move off you. And you know, the record shows it was a it was a mutual split. They both agreed to leave, uh, to or to part ways. So Peyton Manning knows he's got a pretty good coach in John Fox, being that this dude has been to a Super Bowl, he's been to an NFC Championship twice. And he's played in the playoffs multiple years, right? But what else was in Denver that, you know, maybe pay, you know caught Peyton Manning's eye for him to say on his side of the, the bargain, I want to go play in Denver as opposed to every other team in the universe that wanted him, which was probably, I don't know who was playing where at the time, but, you know, you have your 2004 draft class of, like, your Eli Manning, your your Philip Rivers, your Ben Roethlisberger. Obviously, those three teams aren't going to move off him. Then there's Tom Brady. You know, so that rules out four teams off the top of my head. Other than that, all 27 teams, because we've got to subtract Colts from the equation because they're moving off Peyton Manning, wanted a quarterback or definitely looked into Peyton Manning. But what was there for Peyton Manning besides John Fox? Willis McGahee, 720 yards rushing in 2012 after Peyton Manning comes. No Sean Marino, 525 yards rushing after Peyton Manning comes. Demarius Thomas, rest in peace, 1,434 yards after Peyton Manning comes. Eric Decker, 1,064 yards after Peyton Manning comes. So Peyton Manning had a combined 1,200-yard backfield and 1,500-yard total or 2,500 yards total in receiving. And in 2012, the Broncos' offensive line ranked fourth, right? So there was a lot of draw aside from just the Broncos as an organization for Peyton Manning to want to go to Denver. 
right? They have the weapons, they have the coach, and they have the offensive line, right? So let's talk about Russell Wilson. Let's talk about the, the three teams he, he's laid out for, for us to talk about in, in, in the media industry. He said the New York Giants, the New Orleans Saints, the Denver Broncos, ironically, and the Philadelphia Eagles, right? And why I think some of these are smoke and mirrors is because why the hell would Russell Wilson want to play for the New York Giants? Why would he want to play for the Philadelphia Eagles? Because I could argue, I actually could argue for the Eagles, that the Eagles, Saints, and Broncos are all a quarterback away type team, right? The uh, Eagles have three first-round picks. Obviously, some of those would need to be moved in the acquisition of Russell Wilson. The Saints, Sean Payton, phenomenal offensive line, Michael Thomas, Alvin Kamara. The Broncos, Vic Fangio, and we're going to talk about Vic Fangio later in the show, but Vic Fangio, decent head coach, say what you want about him. Very good divisional coach. Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, Javante Williams, Melvin Gordon, probably won't be there next year, but they have Javante Williams, and a great offensive line. Then we have the New York Giants. And you kind of are just left scratching your head because the common denominator, at least in all three of these teams, that besides the Giants, are decent to upper to above average offensive line play, right? And then I would argue that Nick Sirianni, who we're going to talk about later, is a great, great up and coming. I'm not going to put him in that category of elite with Brandon Staley, who we're going to talk about also later in the episode. Um, but Nick Sirianni has proven to me, at least, and I know some other people in the media. Not that it matters, but at least to me, he's proven that he can be a successful head coach within the NFC East, right? Develops an offense around Jalen Hurts. Uh, You know, gave them an identity in 12 games, to to which Joe Judge, uh, coach of the New York Giants, after two years, nobody knows what the Giants are. They don't do anything right. They don't, they don't run the ball well. They don't pass the ball well. Their defense is good, but it's inconsistent, right? So we're going to just remove the Giants from the equation. I think he listed the Giants because his wife, she is like a, a – I don't know if she's a model or whatever, but she obviously wants to go somewhere where there's a big – if you look at these three, these three or four destinations, they're all big cities. They all have nightlife, right? So you got to assume that his, his wife has some say in this. But aside from that, the other three teams make sense. The Broncos make sense. The Saints make sense. The Eagles, to an extent, make sense. Russell Wilson would be the best quarterback in that division. But where I think at the end of the day he's going to go, if we're going, if we're basing it off of the uh, Peyton Manning situation, I think he's going to go to the New Orleans Saints. Because here's, here's how I'm thinking about this, right? Russell Wilson's not getting younger, right? And his play style does not age well, let's say. Being a mobile quarterback, taking those hits outside the pocket, sliding down. He's a great slider, baseball background. But those, that style of play often comes with a higher risk as the older you get, right? Whereas... Whereas, well, at least with the Broncos and Saints, there are great talent at wide receiver with Jerry Judy, with uh, Cortland Sutton, with Michael Thomas, with um, Alvin Kamara, who's basically a wide receiver out of the backfield. There's all of this talent around him with a great offensive line in front of him and a great support system on defense. Like, let's not let that go to not be mentioned. Look at Aaron Rodgers, right? What has been the downfall, not even the downfall, but what has Aaron Rodgers really never had in his entire tenure in Green Bay? He's never had really a top 10 defense for more than a year. So Aaron Rodgers can play both ways of he could play what he could win games with the defense and he could win games in a shootout. Russell Wilson can do the same thing. He can win games with defense, and he can win games in a shootout. This is really the first year we're seeing Russell Wilson with a bottom, tw- like a below a rank twenty defense, right? And you, we're seeing that it's it, at his age and his career, it is too much for him to overcome, right? 
Where with the Saints, you have a phenomenal defense. Nobody's going to be able to run on you. You have a great offensive line, and you have, in my opinion, one of the a, a top five head coach in the NFL. I think Sean Payton is coaching out of his mind, especially this year, without Drew Brees. Right? But with, with Philadelphia, do you want to go there where you really have one perimeter weapon in Devontae Smith? Uh, your running back is always hurt in Miles Sanders. Your coach is still figuring it out. No playoff experience. Do you want to go to the absolute dumpster fire that is the New York Giants? Because if he went to the New York Giants, they're not going to win. They're not going to win the division. They're, they're, if you watch the Miami game, they're an absolute disaster top to bottom. It's well beyond quarterback play. But it, you could make the case of if he were to go to the Broncos or the Saints, that team immediately becomes Super Bowl in, in Super Bowl contention. I do believe that. I think Sean Payton would absolutely know what to do with Russell Wilson. And I also believe that Vic Fangio... Like, the Broncos roster is so talented that they really are quarterback away. This defense is lights out some weeks. And it's hard because it's hard to just bash this defense for being inconsistent because look at how often they are on the field without their offense scoring any points to reward them for the stops they make or the takeaways they, they, they create. So for me, I'll put it on the record here in episode 13, I think Russell Wilson goes to the Saints. I think that makes the most sense where they really don't need the draft capital and they don't need an as elite as an elite defense that they have currently to win with Russell Wilson. They just need a good like an average defense because that's what he's had his entire career. The Super Bowls he's won. I mean, obviously the the exception is when he had the Legion of Boom, but he has had always used like since the Legion of Boom, that defense has never been the same. It's never been that good since. I mean, obviously, the Legion of Boom is like the number one defense in the league for multiple years. But since then, Russell Wilson has still been able to make the playoffs, is my point. Right? And I would argue that the Saints team now is better. The defense is better than those few years post-peak Legion of Boom, where they weren't the number one defense and they were in that top 15 realm. Or range. With the Broncos, they have all the talent in the world on offense. They need to address tack. They need depth at tackle, but their defense is is still in that top fifteen range at its floor going into next year. And if I was the Philadelphia Eagles, I don't really think I would want to tear down the promise we're building for Russell Wilson. I think you could be competitive with Gardner Minshew. I think you could be competitive with Jalen Hurts. Just keep building it. Don't sell the farm with hopes that you'll be this powerhouse of a team. Make sure you're the powerhouse of the team first. The Giants, it would be the absolute dumbest decision of all time to sell their future for Russ Wilson because he wouldn't ele- he would elevate them the least. So, with all that being said, that is my, my takeaway for um, where Russell Wilson will play in 2022. I don't think it makes sense for him to go to the Giants. I think if I had to rank them, it would be Saints, Broncos, Eagles, Giants, if I didn't make that clear in my argument. But anyways, the next thing we are going to talk about, we are for the first time on this channel, I am going to give you my Week 14 game picks. Um, I don't think we've ever done this where I've gone through every single game besides the Thursday game, obviously being that this is coming out on a Friday, where I gave out my game picks. Um, so that being said, I, I I have a pretty good record. I think I've done this twice now, this being the third time. I think I'm 16 and 8. Um, but if you want to fact check me, check our Instagram. But anyways, the first team we have is Pittsburgh at Minnesota. I am t- Oh, wait, we did do the Thursday game. I was wrong there. So there's a first freebie. I had uh, Pittsburgh to win, and maybe if Chase Claypool didn't exist, they win that game. Uh, no, nah, I'm just kidding. Jason Claypool actually really balled out that game, but he did do some dumb, dumb stuff that game. Dallas at Washington. I am taking Dallas. I think that this is a game where if I were to... This is one of the games I think I would flip, If you know, looking back at it. But I think Dallas is good enough to... Like, Washington hasn't beaten the best talent over their winning streak. But Dallas... Dallas is in a situation where... They're, they're, Micah Parsons is dealing with a hamstring injury. Uh, Amari, they're not going to have 100 yards probably. They're not going to have a 100-yard rusher in this game, being that Pollard is hurt. 
Uh, Zeke is nursing an injury. This is going to be a close game. It will be a close game. I forgot what the line is, but we're going to talk about my, my locks for the week, too, which I really should have probably put Washington on there because I think the line is plus three and a half. Um, but I'm taking Dallas to win the game, but I think it's going to be a very, very close football game. Jacksonville at Tennessee. This is another game that I think is going to be closer than expected, but I am taking Tennessee. Um, Jacksonville, they had an internal meeting because Urban Meyer just continues to do stupid stuff, like bench James Robinson the entirety of their offense uh, because he fumbled. That was the dumbest thing I think he could have done. Trevor Lawrence in the whole locker room, I think, was like, Coach, what was that? That was the dumbest thing he could have done. Um, but I'm taking Tennessee to win this game. I just think fundamentally they are a better football team. They have more of an identity. There's more consistency. And I think Dontrell Hilliard and uh, Deonta Foreman will both rush for close to 100 yards on Jacksonville. And Julio Jones will be back for this game. I don't know if it matters too much. Julio Jones hasn't had over 60 yards in a game all season. So do with that what you will. Seahawks at Houston. I'm taking Seattle. I think this is a game where, again, it's just an outclass matchup. Even with Seattle's woes, Jamal Adams is being is out for the season. I don't think Houston stands a chance. I, they have Davis Mills playing. We'll see what Davis Mills could do, but I just think that this is a game where it's just completely out of Seattle, out of Houston's hands. They are at the mercy of how effective and efficient Seattle wants to move the ball. Las Vegas at Kansas City. I am taking Kansas City. I think that. The Chiefs are just on a tear right now. They beat the Raiders during their win streak. They beat the Giants and the Raiders, and they held the Raiders to nine points in that win uh, while also scoring 40 points on them. I think there's too much dysfunction for the for Vegas to overcome this matchup. I just think that this is going to be, and especially coming off of a bye, the Chiefs, or did they have their bye last week? Yeah, they, they actually, they're two weeks off of bye, but the Chiefs are always a better team off of a bye after, under Andy Reid. Plus, they're fighting their stride on offense. Um, and their defense has been lights out the past two months. Um, or the past month, excuse me. New Orleans at Jets. I'm picking the Saints. I don't think this should come to a surprise or come as a surprise to anybody. Um, I just think that the Saints, again, they went toe-to-toe with Dallas. If they had a quarterback, if they had Jameis, they would potentially win that game. Um, I think they're going to have absolute, the Jets are going to have absolute fits um, against New Orleans with Taysom Hill running the ball, Alvin Kamara running the ball, and the passing attack. So we'll see what happens. We'll see how Robert Sala game plans. But this is a game where I just think there's zero, not zero percent chance that anything happen, but a very low percent chance that the Jets win this game. Uh, Chicago at Green Bay. We're taking Green Bay. We heard it from the horse's mouth. Aaron Rodgers owns Chicago, and I think he's 100% right. I don't know, really know why he's getting any flack for saying that, but he's right. He it, Look at his record against Chicago. He always... He has an incredible record against Chicago. I don't know the percentage, but I think it's above 82% win percentage against the Chicago Bears. Atlanta at Carolina. I am taking the uh, Falcons. I think Carolina could be the better team if they were healthy. I think even with their dysfunction at quarterback, I think they're a better team um, top to bottom. They're definitely a better defense. Definitely could generate a better pass rush. They have weapons uh, on the perimeter with DJ Moore, but with uh, Cam Newton under center, I have little to no faith in them, and especially the cherry on top being that uh, Christian McCaffrey's out. I think the Atlanta Cordero Pattersons are going to run all over Carolina, um, and I think that with how bad Carolina's offensive line has been, predominantly at left tackle, the little pass rush Atlanta has, I think it'll be more effective than we're going to give it credit for otherwise. Baltimore at Cleveland. I picked Baltimore, but looking at it, I kind of want to take Cleveland. I'm going to update this on... Um, on Instagram. I just think that Cleveland, even though Cleveland is the inferior team and did lose to Baltimore already this season, I think with Lamar Jackson playing the way he has been and how banged up this Baltimore team is, Marcus Peters is now out for an extended period of time. I don't know how they're going to I don't know how they're going to stop Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. I have no faith in Baker Mayfield to literally do anything against this banged up secondary, but I don't know how they're going to stop um the running attack, and I don't really know how uh, Baltimore is going to produce yards. And I think this is a game where, not produce yards, but I think this is a game where Baltimore, they can't afford turnovers. Lamar Jackson is averaging like 1.5 turnovers over the past month. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm taking Cleveland. I'm going to change this on Instagram. Uh, New York Giants at Chargers. I'm taking the Chargers. This should be an absolute blowout. I think Jake Fromm is starting for the Giants. It might be Mike Lennon. Who knows? Who cares? They're both trash. J- uh, Chargers by 100. Detroit at Denver. I'm taking Denver. I think this is just... Uh, even though Detroit were just beat the Vikings, 
I did say in our power rankings video, if I had to pick three teams to lose to the Lions this season, it would have been the Vikings at number one, the Giants at two, and probably um, Seattle at three. Like that, those are definitely teams that would find a way to lose to Detroit. I don't think Denver is one of them. I think Denver is too good at controlling the clock. Um, the running attack is very hard to stop with, with just Javante Williams. Um, and then I think if you add uh, Teddy Bridgewater back to the mix, you have Vic Fangio, who's a great defensive coach. I think it's going to be very hard. And the Lions are going to be trying out a new offense with a new down-the-field attack. So we'll see how that works out in this game. But I think the consistency of the, the Broncos is going to push them over the edge over the Lions. Coming, not coming in, San Francisco at Cincinnati. I like the Niners in this game. I said this also in our Power Rankings video. The key to winning for Cincinnati that increases their win percentage by about 10 to 15%, in my opinion, is being able to run the ball with Joe Mixon because if they can't run block, then Joe Mixon is going to have 25 yards or 25 carries for about 60 yards. It's happened before. Look it up. Uh, but Joe Mixon had been getting better and fighting his groove with the offensive line, and they had been uh, they had been using him more in the passing game out of the backfield. But he might not play this game because he's dealing with a neck, a neck injury. If he doesn't play, I think San Francisco is going to be able to stuff whatever they throw at them with Samaj P. Ryan um, and Chris Evans if he plays. Um, I also think with Elijah, uh, Elijah Mitchell probably coming out of um, concussion, concussion protocol, I, I like the 49ers in this game. Buffalo at Tampa. I'm taking Tampa, but this is a game where it's really hard not to take Buffalo because they're definitely going to come out hungry. But I just think with the potency of Leonard Fournette out of the backfield now catching passes and now basically running at will, it's going to be very hard for Buffalo to stop that. But I think Josh Allen will be able to take advantage of this banged up Bucks secondary. So this is a toss-up game. I'm leaning Bucks because I think they've just been... I just think that they're the better team, the more consistent team. I know that sounds crazy, but they are the same team that they were last year. But Buffalo has more new pieces. So I don't know. I think this game could go e either way, but I'm going to give the edge to uh, Tom Brady um, at home. And then Los Angeles Rams at Arizona. I am taking the Rams to win this game. I actually thought I picked the Cardinals. We're going to switch that to the Cardinals. Uh, I'll change this on Instagram too. I'm going to take the Cardinals. I think the reason why the Rams really aren't going to win this game is because unless they go back to the fundamentals of their offense, of what made their offense successful, I think that it's going to be very hard to beat Arizona because this new offense they have didn't work against Arizona last time, and I don't think it's going to work this time. What did beat Arizona last year was their fundamentally sound offense with pre-snap motion, play-action pass, and moving the pocket. I think if they try to do this air raid offense against Arizona, it's not going to work well. So I'm going to update this on Instagram. The two changes we're making live are Cleveland over Baltimore and the Cardinals over... Um, the Rams, but teams on by, I don't think I mentioned it, uh, Colts, Dolphins, Patriots, Eagles, but this is good stuff, I like this a lot, I think that, you know, gonna be another good week for my game picks, um, I've been solid, I don't know what my record is looking at, I can't do math right now, but I've been pretty good, I've been pretty, pretty, pretty solid, um, but anyways, uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about, next segment, is coaches on the hot seat and which ones will be gone in 2022. So I want to just sip this drink real quick. I want to just say this about coaches on the hot seat and what should go into this, this idea of who should be on the hot seat, who should we fire, who should we move off of. I want to look at what should put, on, put a coach on a hot seat. Because I think often, more often than not, fans get so caught up in the wins and losses, right? Which, if we're going off of wins and losses, then the Niners should move off of Kyle Shanahan. Here's what I'll say. And I, I kind of, I heard that, I read this, I forget where I read it. But I totally agree with what they were saying. And I'm going to use it because they're right. And I think that this opinion that they have is totally accurate. I think it's a totally sound um, way of thinking, and I think that we'll borrow it. But what should put a coach on the hot seat, right? In your first year, you're expecting the growing pains, probably with a new GM, 
unless you're like the Patriots or something, but you're probably going to experience growing pains and the new GM and the head coach are going to have to work through it together, right? That's what you would expect. So after year one, like let's look at Dan Campbell. Dan Campbell's not winning a lot of games, but you can start to see something, right? And I think the benchmark for a coach that you should not put on the hot, like what you would want to see from a rookie coach, right? Brandon Staley with the Chargers. He's now 12 games, 13 games into his into his tenure, and you could see what he's doing with the team. Sure, it had great pieces under Anthony Lynn, but there really was no identity. With Brandon Staley, you're seeing an aggressive football team. They're going to go for it on fourth down. They're going to do, they're going to be a very aggressive offense. And you add that with Brandon Staley's prowess at defense on the defensive side of the ball. Look at their defense versus last year's. There's not too many changes in terms of personnel, but it's a completely different defense. Yeah, they added a stud rookie in Asante Samuel Jr., but even with the weakness of not being able to really stop the run, Brandon Staley has committed to, we're going to let you run three to four yards every time on us, but you're going to get tired. We're not going to let you go for the kill shot. We're going to let you beat us a hard and exhausting, in a hard and exhausting method, right? That's what, I, if I was the owner, or if I was the GM, I know I found my guy. And let's talk about Nick Sirianni for a second, because I said him too at the beginning of the video. With Nick Sirianni, everybody went into this year looking at the Eagles as if this is just going to be a throwaway year. This is going to be a year where they're rebuilding. They're finding their identity. And in, I would say about, again, 12 games. I think Brandon Staley did it before 12 games. But now we're seeing this, like, the confirmation of what they are. With Nick Sirianni, I think he's found it. And what do the Eagles do? Like, what do the Eagles do since their first few losses at the beginning of the season? They run the hell out of the football. They run it. They are one of the best rushing offenses in the NFL where that's with J. It's finding ways to create this identity. It's finding ways to succeed with what you have. And I think a lot of teams are more talented than the Eagles, but have not found that way to succeed. Let's look at the Giants, right? The Giants roster has talent on it. You see names, Saquon Barkley, uh, Kenny Galladay. James Bradbury coming off of Pro Bowl year. Leonard Williams coming off of Pro Bowl year. They signed a Dory Jackson. Blake Martinez, a Pro Bowl snub last year, if you want to go that far. But they still can't do anything. They just don't do anything well. There's and This is why Joe Judge, I'm going to give a spoiler, he is probably the coach on the hottest seat, but he's not going to leave. They're not going to move off of him. But if I was the owner, I would want him gone. <laughs> Because there's no identity yet. You've had this team for two years, two full years now, and you haven't done anything with it. There's You didn't elevate the team to any sort of level. It's just a flounder. It's like a Magikarp using Splash Attack. Anyway, that's enough Pokemon references. I was thinking about Blake Martinez. Dude's obsessed with Pokemon cards. Anyway, but with Nick Sirianni, way less talented roster, maybe not way less talented roster, but a less talented roster and they have found ways to be competitive in the division. They're like not out of the, the division race yet. Sure, they just beat the Jets with Gardner Minshew, but they're still in it. Washington is still in it. The only one that's not in it is the Giants. But so my two examples of what you should look for in a coach, of what of what would keep a coach off the hot seat. There's one other thing that I would say of why you shouldn't hit the eject button on a coach, even though things aren't go, even though they aren't things aren't going the way that you planned. But they do something else right. And we're going to talk about that when we get to them. But I want to talk about the coaches that should be on the hot seat for the reasons I just mentioned, right? Number one is Joe Judge. We talked about him for a good, a good few minutes. But Joe Judge has not elevated the Giants at all. He has not done anything. And here's the, the kicker, literally the kicker for the Giants. You brought in a special teams guy. You should be sound on special teams. You should be a disciplined team on special teams. They are one of the worst teams in the NFL when it comes to special teams. They are horrible at special teams. So this dude's specialty now sucks on your roster, right? You have a generational running back who you've basically killed because you never built him an offensive line. You can't run the ball. You pretty much just ended Daniel Jones' career, potentially if this structural neck damage is legit. 
and he might never play again. You got into Daniel Jones' career, and you brought in all these weapons. Like I, To Dave Gettleman's credit, he has put talent on this roster. He had Pat Shermer was way more successful, at least on offense, with less talent. Now you give Joe Judge a very talented offense, and they don't do anything right. They don't even do special teams right. Joe Judge should 100% be gone in 2022, but he will not be. And I kind of and I did make the the case of why he shouldn't be in 2022 before the Miami game. But now after watching the Miami game, he should be gone. Um, but I will I still do stand by what I said about. I want to see it through to the end if I were a Giants fan because he got a lot of open-ended questions. But if Daniel Jones is gone, like if he if he can't play anymore, you just get rid of Joe Judge and hit the nuke button and start over. But if Daniel Jones does come back this season, prayers out to him. You, I think you keep Joe Judge for one more year because you're going to find out, do I have a franchise guy? Do I have a franchise coach? It, franchise QB, franchise coach. And then because they're together, if you find the answer either yes and no or no and yes and no, no, or yes, yes, you can move from there and start clean, right? So I think Joe Judge should be literally his seat should be on fire. Maybe he stays for another year. But if they get a new GM and it's not an in-house guy, I would just just scrap it. Just blow it up. Maybe keep Daniel Jones for one more year. Do what the Jets did. Uh, sign, sign the fifth-year option. Let him play year four. And then if he still can't put it together, you just trade him. The next coach is Matt Nagy. Basically for all the same reasons. Matt Nagy with Mitch Trubisky, you kind of could see what they were doing on offense. They were designing a playbook where it masked all their weaknesses. It was a lot of, we're going to show you what you expect to see and then not do it. A lot of smoke and mirrors, I guess. Now, it just looks like they're playing Madden. Like, you might as well just give Matt and Aggie the Madden playbook and just be like, all right, go do your thing. And their defense, they did have a good defense. It's a very expensive defense, nonetheless. It's a disaster. Like, it is a complete and utter disaster. So, in a year where you now have, uh, I'm not sure if they have a new GM, but you have a franchise quarterback, which I would imagine is the new, if they do have a new GM. Well, here's the thing I'll say about Justin Fields. Whether this GM picked him or not, if I was coming into the Bears organization, I would let Justin Fields play out his rookie contract. Because I think Justin Fields is a player where there is a lot of promise with him. I do, I'm a huge fan of Justin Fields. I think, like other young quarterbacks, he's in the, one of the worst situations ever, like Trevor Lawrence, but... Matt Nagy has not developed anything with the Bears. We thought he was this guy who could play to his team's, he could mask his team's strengths, but he's just clearly not. He's clearly not that guy, and he clearly doesn't know how to coach a defense. And I think that Matt Nagy will be fired next year. Joe Judge should be fired next year, but will he? I don't think so. Matt Nagy should be and will be, in my opinion. He might be fired. He was, I think if they had lost on Thanksgiving to the Lions, he was gone. I don't think that was just a false rumor. I think it's because they won that game. It's very hard as an owner or GM to fire someone off of, off of a win. Ask any analyst or ex-NFL player how, what that situation looks like. Because you'll all, they'll all agree that you just can't do it. it it's, not, it's not the right thing to do. Um, and then another coach who's probably on the hot seat, I think he's gone if they don't make playoffs this year. I think he's gone anyway. Uh, Mike Zimmer. So... If you watched last game, last night's game against the Steelers, uh, Mike Zimmer, in the first half, put on like a defensive masterpiece. Like, sure, Big Ben looks like a tree out there. Like, he can't move to save his life. That three-yard scramble he had was like the most breathtaking scramble I've ever seen in my life because it was like if someone hits him, he's just going to turn to dust, like Obi-Wan Kenobi and... Uh, a new hope. Like, he's just gone. But, in the back half of that game, they couldn't stop the Steelers to save their life. The Steelers scored, I think, 21 points in six minutes. You can't be that inconsistent throughout a season. You can't be that inconsistent in two halves of a football game. It's just not, it, it, you can't do it. And I think in a team that's probably going to be looking to rebuild very soon, I think they should start to start the rebuild this year. It doesn't mean change the quarterback or anything like that. But if you're going to fire the GM and you're going to fire the coach, you're pretty much starting a rebuild. 
But I think now is the time to go out and draft developmental pieces. Maybe not a quarterback yet, but um, go out and draft uh, like a cornerback or a position that has high upside, but you have you need time of development, like a cornerback. Like I think cornerbacks have the most of one of the highest effects on defense, but take the longest to develop. It's like a plant. Um, but anyways, I think I think Mike Zimmer's probably gone if they miss. Definitely gone if they miss playoffs. Might be gone anyway. Um, and then I threw in a dark horse here, uh, Mike McCarthy. And here's my reasoning. Yeah, the Cowboys are very successful right now. But what is Jerry Jones paying Mike McCarthy to do? He's not calling plays. He's not coaching the defense. He's just in press conferences. I think they probably are going to fire him just it, because at this point he's just a sunk he's sunk cost. Like you're just paying him, I guess for his experience. But at this point, he should have had, or you have uh, Dan Quinn, who's also there, who is a, a, an ex head coach who's gone to a Super Bowl. If you want to groom Kellen Moore, you don't need Mike McCarthy to do it because, like we saw when Mike McCarthy had COVID, they promoted uh, Dan Quinn. And he was able to beat the Saints. They struggled, but he beat the Saints. And, you know, some coaches in this league, if you've been around long enough, you have someone's number. Like, you know what they're going to do and you know how to beat them. And to Sean Payton's credit, he has Dan Quinn's number after being in the division with him for so long. But Dan Quinn now has a talented enough roster where he beat the, he could beat him. You don't need Mike McCarthy anymore. You if you want to groom Kellen Moore for another year, you just kick Mike McCarthy to the curb, stop paying him because you're not paying him basically to do nothing. Um, and you are, you could groom Kellen Moore under Dan Quinn, who has shown that he could, one, beat his biggest weakness at head coach in Sean Payton. And if he could do that, he could beat a lot of other teams. He was very successful with the, with the Falcons. So, I don't know, man. I, I just... Don't really see the reason why Mike McCarthy is on here is not that he's on a hot seat. I just think he's gonna be fired. Like I don't think they need him for anything. If you're a Cowboys fan, and you're listening to this and you made it this far, thank you. Comment like what Mike McCarthy does because, or if you're on, if you're listening on Spotify, tweet at me. Um, but yeah, like I, I don't know what what this dude does. Uh, anyway, and then I'm gonna talk about coaches that probably were on the, like were on the hot seat at one point this season, but now definitely should be off off the hot seat. Kyle Shanahan. When the Niners were, I believe, I want to say two and four, that could that number could be wrong. Kyle Shanahan was starting. There's a lot of buzz generating around Kyle Shanahan. Like, did he just have a good roster? Is he that good of a head coach? And like, I brought up the point that he doesn't win too many. Like, he hasn't won too many games in his tenure, but he's been to a Super Bowl. He's shown that he could coach around his team's weaknesses and coach to his team's strengths, and. They have been on a tear this year. We don't know what this team is going to look like next year. I think if they struggle with Lance like a lot, and Lance just looks like a bust, maybe he'll be back on the hot seat because he greenlighted the okay to give all of those picks away for Trey Lance. They gave away three first rounders. Uh, I think Trey Lance is going to be very good, and I think he's actually going to elevate the Niners to the next level. Um, but I think he is someone who's off the hot seat. And then another coach I think is off the hot seat is Brian Flores. Brian Flores got a lot of crap, especially from Dolphins fans. Like uh, Naturally, as a Dolphins fan, I'd probably be upset with Brian Flores at the beginning of the year. But I don't think they really comprehended or really wanted to accept what he was dealing with. Like Trying to win games with Jacoby Brissett and a struggling defense is not easy. And did you notice that since their defense has come back to form, like Jalen Phillips went from being irrelevant to now the second the rookie with the second most sacks in the NFL. They have been on a win streak and they're going to win this week against the Jets. Like we'll see how they do after the Jets, but they have won games and Tua like Brian Flores to his credit has unquestionably had faith in Tua all season long. Through all the Deshaun Watson rumors, he has said Tua is our guy. Tua is our guy. We trust in Tua. We believe in Tua. He's probably been the only supporter in that organization of Tua because the owner wanted Deshaun Watson, and he made that no secret. So Brian Flores has shown that like, even after year one, like we talk about developing an identity, that was a very stingy Dolphins team. And in year two, it was a 
very good Dolphins team. Very competitive, a very good defensive team. Year three, they kind of sputtered in the beginning, but now they're on a six, uh, what, a five game, six game win streak? No, they were one and seven, and now they're six and seven, so they're on a five game win streak. Sure, they haven't beaten the best teams, but notably, they did beat the Baltimore Ravens, right? So, Vic, uh, not Vic Fangio, Brian Flores is starting to develop this, this, this identity for the Dolphins of, he, I mean, to be honest, he's basically recreating, like, Tua is a lefty Mac Jones, if you really think about it. Um, don't take too many chances. Don't turn the ball over. Efficient. Moves the ball well. Tua, I'd argue, is more athletic than Mac Jones, but that's about it. And not by much. Like, they're not, like, they're not anything crazy. Um, the last, last coach I would have on this list, and this is definitely a candidate to get fired. Is Vic Fangio. And though the Broncos haven't been everything they've dreamed of as, as in terms of ownership, here's what I will say about Vic Fangio. Since entering the league as a head coach, he has been one of the best defensive-minded head coaches in the league. And most notably, this is another reason of why I would not fire a head coach based off wins and losses, is if you could answer this question, I'll be impressed, but you're going to answer it to yourself, so you're on the honor system. Comment if you got it right. What has Vic Fangio done in the division that, or what strength does Vic Fangio have within the division that he doesn't have outside of the division? And I think this is important for your head coach, being that you do have to play three teams six times a year, that you should be able to turn those games into wins. He has given Justin Herbert an exceptionally difficult time every time he plays the Broncos. Justin Herbert, with Brandon Staley or with Anthony Lynn, struggles very much so to get against the Broncos, and he often turns the ball over against the Broncos. We saw the pick six with Patrick Sertan. That's something that I would definitely want in a head coach. Now, is it good enough to keep him? I don't know because he gets dominated by the Chiefs. Like he can, he cannot beat the Chiefs. So I guess if you're competitive enough, where you could beat the Chargers divisional rival and you could beat the Raiders divisional rival four like four times, and then you lose two times to the Chiefs, it counterbalances. Or if you could sweep the Chargers and then split with the Raiders, it counterbalances. But I think that I would give Vic Fangio one more year because they're truly a quarterback away team and the quarterbacks that they could potentially get are Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson. I do think if you've watched our mock draft videos, I have been a a fan of them drafting Sam Howell and Sam Howell is probably the only team or the only quarterback if I were the Broncos I would draft in the first round. If he's not there, I would take a a lineman just because there's so much familiarity with Sam Howell being that it's an RPO style offense. He has familiarity with uh, Javante Williams and we saw what he could do with talent. Like Deontay Brown was very good at UNC and he has sucked in the NFL. So if you give him Jerry Judy, if you give him Cortland Sutton, if you give him uh, Tim Patrick, we'll see what he could do in the NFL. But I think the better option is just to go out and get an Aaron Rodgers. And I do believe that if they got Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson, like we talked about at the beginning of this podcast. Yeah. They would be very competitive, and they would have – if they got Aaron Rodgers, they would have the best quarterback in that division. I do believe that. I think Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback in the NFL right now over everybody, maybe not Tom Brady, just because Tom Brady is playing at an MVP level, which is nuts, at 44, 43 years old. But anyway, those are all the coaches I think on the hot seat uh, and which ones will be gone in 2022. I think that a lot of them that are on the hot seat will probably stay. I think the only two, the only one that will certainly be gone is Matt Nagy, and then I think Mike Zimmer will also be gone. I think Joe Judge, even though he should be on the hottest seat in the NFL, will stay. And I also think that Mike McCarthy probably. I actually don't know about Mike McCarthy. I think if it's not bro, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But why you got to like why are you gonna pay him? That's just my opinion on it. Um, oops, I went backwards. Uh, anyway, the next thing we are going to talk about is my locks for the weekend. So if you're a sports better, always bet responsibly. But here are some of the picks that I would make if I was gambling this weekend. Um, I'm not sponsored by anybody or anything like that. So if anybody's listening and they want to sponsor me, you're more than welcome. Um, And don't be a stranger. But anyway, um, yeah, these are all from Fox uh, Fox Sports Bet. That's where I got the odds or the the, the lines. So let's go ahead and get into these in the, into these picks. Um, so far against the spread, I think I've done this for I want to say five weeks. 
and the first time I put a bet in on every single game, like I gave a pick for every single game, which was so stupid. So that really has skewed my record, but all of the records are on Instagram, so if you want to go look at my track record, check out our Instagram, at the underscore pilot underscore cam. But we have really battled back from that deficit we put ourselves in. We went one week, we went five for six. Now I just do six bets, so these are my six picks for the week. Um, coming in at number one, or I guess just the first bet I saw that I was like, yep, it's locked, is the Saints minus five and a half at the Jets. I think this defense is too, especially with Zach Wilson playing, I think that this offensive line is in shambles. I think they're going to get eaten alive by uh, the Jet, uh, the Saints defensive front. And I think Sean Payton is going to give Zach Wilson absolute fits on defense. I don't see the Jets moving the ball because really how have the Jets been able to move the ball is through the run. Who's one of the best teams in the NFL at stopping the run? The Saints. So I think five and a half is more than a lock. I think you could tease this down to like seven and a half possibly. Um, I would tease it down to six and a half though just so it's a clean touchdown. Um, but yeah, I think the Saints, Saints are going to win. I would take Saints money line, um, but I also think that f- minus five and a half is just Vegas giving you money. Anyway, next pick at plus two and a half, we have the Atlanta Falcons at Carolina Panthers. Like we kind of mentioned earlier when we went through our game picks, I don't see how the Panthers are going to score points. Like that's my biggest thing is like their offensive line is terrible. AJ Terrell is playing out of, like that kid is cracked and he's not... That, you want to talk about an underrated player, A.J. Terrell. That kid is playing out of his mind. Um, but I think he's playing at a very, very high level. He's going to lock up D.J. Moore. And even if A.J. Terrell wasn't there, who's throwing D.J. Moore the ball? It's not Cam Newton, that's for sure. Um, and P.J. Walker is like, I feel bad for him because he just doesn't have time to even do Like, he's not that good as it is, and he needs to be able to go through his progressions that he can't do because there's not enough time. Um... I just think with Christian McCaffrey being out, there's no quarterback play, and there really is no offensive line. I don't see how the Panthers are scoring in this game. Sam Darnold's not come back, right? If Sam Darnold's come back, I still think they plus two and a half is still a lock, but it would change things a little bit. Um, but with Atlanta, like I think Russell Gage has proven he is good enough. Excuse me. To um, be a, a, a serviceable wide receiver one in the meantime. I don't think he's anything. He's not in that elite level or anything like that, but he has been more than fine. He has been a great wide receiver for them. Kyle Pitts has been inconsistent, but great, and I blame that more on Matt Ryan than I do Kyle Pitts. And the Atlanta Cordero Patterson, so I call them all the time on this channel. That guy's not going to be stopped. However, you want a game plan for him, good luck. He literally is doing what Christian. He is this year's Christian McCaffrey, honestly. <laughs> like, that dude is catching passes, he's running the ball. Is phenomenal. I think that the I think the, the Atlanta probably wins this by a touchdown. To being honest, like I think the Panthers. Like, if the Panthers are going to win, it's going to be from defense. It's not going to be from offense. But anyway, coming in, not coming in. Next pick, uh, San Francisco at Bengals minus one and a half. I think because the Bengals aren't going to be able to run the ball as effectively as I'd like them to be. I think when they can run with Joe Mixon, they're way more likely to win to win games. Um, but with him being out. And how good that 49ers front has been. I really like the Niners in this game. I don't think the Bengals are going to be able to do borderline anything on the ground. I also like the Niners secondary. It's not anything elite, but it's not bad. It's very much so average, in my opinion. I could be wrong about that. But I think that the Niners are... At one and a half, like, I would would maybe... If I'm not... I try to go off just the lines because I think it's more impressive if I'm right just picking lines. But if I were taking this bet, I would tease it down probably to like four and a half because there's always that what if this is a shootout game because I really would take Joe Burrow in a shootout over Jimmy Garoppolo. But Debo Samuel is back, so I think that is a lot of added benefit for the Niners. Elijah Mitchell is probably going to play in this game, so I really like And if he doesn't, like the Niners' offensive line is good enough to open holes for Jermichael Hasty, who is the last standing back in that backfield. But... The next pick is the Cardinals minus two and a half versus the Rams. Like we made the adjustment live, I made the adjustment when I was, you know, making this 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 video. But the nine, I think the Cardinals, they beat the new Rams. They beat this new school Rams team pretty handily. Like blew them out when the Rams were at their peak. Now that the Rams are slumping, I don't see them if they do the same like insanity the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results if they do the same thing against the cardinals they're gonna get the same result so i don't know i also don't know if they're really gonna make an adjustment to be honest with you or if the adjustment they make is gonna be good enough because they need to be able to run the ball and daryl henderson has been hurt sony michelle did just rush for over 100 yards 
but it was against the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. So I'm not gonna really credit them anything like that. But Kyler Murray has been playing exceptionally well off the injury. He came back guns blazing. DeAndre Hopkins is gonna be uh, him and Jalen Ramsey usually have a good matchup, but I think there are more holes in the Rams secondary than there are in that Cardinals air raid offense. So I think it's going to be a big game for AJ Green, big game for Rondell Moore, big game for Chris Kirk. I think all those guys are going to give them fits. Um, and I think Chase Edmonds is back in this game. And then the Rams' one defense hasn't been anything special this year. Uh, so I'm taking the Cardinals minus two and a half. Uh, the next pick is the Chargers at, uh, versus the Giants um, minus ten. I think that the Giants with Jake Fromm or Mike Lennon, like they just don't stand a chance. I don't think there's too much to be said here. I think even though Keenan Allen is out, Austin Eckler is hurt. Um, Mike Williams is probably going to play, and I think, I just think that this could has potential to be a low-scoring game for the Chargers. The Giants typically are a low-scoring team, so I think for the Chargers, their low-scoring game is probably like 21 points. It's going to be more than enough to outmatch the Giants. Brandon Staley is good enough coach to just, if Jake Fromm is in, there's they probably score six points. If Mike Glennon is in, they scored, what, nine points last week? They're probably going to score less than nine points. Um, but I think Chargers minus 10 is a lot. Absolute lock for Scott. And then last pick is this one really pains me to, to take, but uh, Browns minus three versus the Ravens. I think the Ravens are just so injured that they're not like they can't overcome it. Like I think they're beyond. They have gone through the threshold of like yeah, like they could keep it close, but now they're so hurt that they probably won't be able to keep it as close as they'd like against the Browns. And I think the Brown, like, I think Baker Mayfield even could take advantage of this this weak Ravens secondary. And I hate to say that because it, he's just not good. But anyway, those are my picks for the week. Let me know if you take them. Let me know how you do. If you, these will be on Instagram. So again, like, check out our Instagram uh, channel, but, or Instagram account. But uh, yeah, like, all these, all these will be on Instagram. It'll be in a nice little, nice little graphic. But uh, yeah. Let me know what you think of these picks. Let me know which ones you're taking. Let's, let me know which ones you think I should take. Um, or let me know which ones you think should just be on here and et cetera. Anyways, the last thing we are going to talk about in this podcast episode is usually, as always, the most telling games of the week. And we're going to kind of power through these. Uh, there's just not too much to be said about them. I think we're at a point where like a lot of teams' identities are, are set. And unless there's playoff implications, there's not too much to talk about. So... It's still going to be worth your time. It's definitely still stay tuned in. But, um, yeah, let's talk about these games. The first game of the week is the New York Giants at Miami Dolphins. So the reason why I put this one on here is not so much for the Dolphins. Um, I think with the news of Daniel Jones being out, everybody kind of expected the Dolphins to come in and win this game. But here's why I put this game on here, right? Everybody points, and I, I, I am a Daniel Jones defender. I will defend Daniel Jones. I don't think anybody in this planet will. Um, but here's why I put this on here. Because there's this narrative of Daniel Jones is a bust. Daniel Jones is this. Daniel Jones is holding the Giants back. If you watched this game, right, Giants fans or not, you would have felt like seen how fundamentally bad this team is on every side of the football. Like, it was... You're gonna be. You're gonna check the box score and be like, "Oh wow, Saquon Barkley averaged five yards per carry." No, he again ran for about one to two yards or negative yards, and then broke one runoff that saved his day. Right? The offensive line can't block or create holes to save their lives. The defense, James Bradbury, is nothing like he was last year. Absolutely nothing. Let up, I think, uh, two touchdowns in this game. It's just, they're just terrible. They're so inconsistent. And, like, I, I think this game, and why I'm highlighting it is, like, I think it put the Daniel Jones narrative to bed of, like, okay, it really isn't him. Like, it's not. They, they, the coach is a mess. He's calling timeouts on with six seconds left in a quarter. He's calling timeouts to, 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 to not get a delay of game penalty on second and 23. Brilliant call, Joe. And then they can't move the, they can't keep anybody healthy, man. Like, could, Kenny Galladay got bumped into on the sideline and was out for a half with a rib injury. Like, that dude is literally... Like, I could beat Kenny Galladay in a fight. Like, 100%. 100%. Because I'll just blow on him hard enough and he'll be... He'll have to go... He'll have to see a medical staff. Like, it's not... 
it's just like the, the most poverty of poverty franchises. And let's talk a little bit about the Dolphins. This team, yeah, they're on, like this is the reason I didn't move them in their power rankings. The line for this game was only seven and a half, with Mike Glennon in and all these players hurt, and Joe Judge as the, as the head coach. They are horrible, man. This Giants team is horrible, and the Dolphins struggled for a while. If it wasn't for the Giants defense stopping them after stopping them, and then their offense coming on the field and throwing a pick or going three and out instantly, giving the defense about two seconds of rest. Like, if Daniel Jones plays, I would argue they win this game. But with how bad this team is top to bottom, like, it really kind of made me take a step back and go, okay, well, how good is Tua actually? I think you win games with Tua. I think, like Mac Jones, you could win games with Tua. I love Mac Jones. I'm a huge Mac Jones fan, and I think Tua is very similar to Mac Jones. He's a lefty Mac Jones. But now when you're talking about, like, franchise guy, I guess, you start to question it again. He struggled against this Giants defense. Granted, he's out there with just Jalen Waddle, but Devontae Parker balled out that game. Like what? Like I said, like Devontae Parker is a very good player when he's on the field. Um, but I think both of these, like one, is actually looked on in a like the Giants are looked on in a better light than I think they should be when it comes to as a team. And I think the Dolphins are catching a little bit too hype. Like after this game, and like this week they're going to beat the Jets. Uh, not the Jets. Who do they play this week? Oh, they're on a bye, and then they play the Jets. So, I don't know, man. Like, I think the Dolphins are, are catching their stride, but they have been on, like, they've been beating bad, like, very bad teams. Um, but let's talk about the next game is the Eagles at Jets. So, here's what I want to say about this game. And I'll, I'll post this question out there. This might get me some hate, but it's fine. Are the Eagles a better team with Gardner Minshew? Like, let's think about it. Let, let's have this. Let's have this hard discussion, right? Let's talk about it. Because here's my argument. And like, I think I've been very like on this channel. I've been very fair with Jalen Hurts. I think I've been more than fair with him. I think I've given him the benefit of the doubt more often than not. <clears throat> Here's what I'm going to say. With Jalen Hurts, like I also like, let me preface. I don't want to overreact because it was against the Jets, but from what I saw, I saw things that the Eagles haven't done all year. Which again, Nick Sirianni playing to his team strengths, why he's going to be a good coach. With Jalen Hurts, right? You run for 200 yards. You pass for maybe 110, 115, 150, which is not good. With Gardner Minshew, they threw for almost, I think, over 200 yards, and Miles Sanders had the best game of his season with 120 rushing yards. So now you're a dual-threat team versus a one-dimensional, one-threat team like the Browns. Are the Eagles better with Gardner Minshew is the question. I say yes, but I'm saying yes off of one week. I should be saying, like, my my my... The fan in me wants to say yes or better with Gardner Minshew. But the brain on my shoulder says, let's see it for one more week. And I don't think we're gonna get we're gonna we're going to get to unless Jalen Hurst gets hurt again or he just has another piss poor performance. But I don't know, man. Gardner looked really good. And like I get it was the Jets, but he looked like a starter against the Jets. Like tw I think he finished that game 21 for 25 and was like a 13 for 13, at, or 11 for 13 at one point, being 11, 11 for 11 at one point. So he's he was dealing. He was, like, Mishu Mania was dealing. So that, that's why I wanted to bring this team up is, are they better with, with Gardner Minshew? So I think it's a very real question. You have three picks next year. You're probably not going to take one on a quarterback. But do you want to try to build around Gardner Minshew? See what happens, and then you could draft one in a stronger class if it doesn't work. Or, I mean, it's either that or Jalen. I think you don't draft the quarterback this year, if I'm being honest. But, I don't know, man. 
This was an interesting game for me. Like, they, Minshew was dealing, and to the Jets' credit, they were, like, kind of carving him up at, at one point. That was probably Zach, uh, Zach Wilson's best game so far. Um, but the last game I want to talk about, <laughs> and now that I have time, I want to talk about this game. So I talked about it a little bit in our power rankings, and I try to control myself. The New England Patriots at the Buffalo Bills. And I want to start with what Nick Wright said. Because, to me... Nick Wright is the worst analyst in, in on television. Like he, it is incredible to me that he gets paid, right? This dude comes on, right? Well, let's just think about it, guys. The Chiefs. Who's going to beat the Chiefs? The Chiefs are the best team in the NFL. All right, pause. Wrong. It's already wrong. It's already wrong. And then he goes on as far to say that as to like his reasoning for why was like, wow, you just said that. Like you are just trying to. It just is incredible he gets paid. Like it's, it's actually incredible he gets paid. Because you can't even talk about the Chiefs without mentioning LeBron James somehow. But anyway. He says. That he would rather take this Chiefs team now, right? Defense has been good for a month. He'd rather take this Chiefs team now over the one that scores 35 to 30 points a game. So let's just rewind the clocks two years. What have the Chiefs done scoring 35, 30 points a game with an okay defense? Oh, gone to a Super Bowl and won a Super Bowl. What has this Chiefs team done? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And, like, I'll be honest with you. I got a little bit crazy and said the Chiefs were going to miss the playoffs, but I really did believe it, and I was wrong. I shouldn't have doubted Andy Reid or Patrick Mahomes. But, like, that's, that, that, that is where this dude is at, right? And then he wants to go out and say, let's not be fooled to think that this was a good game plan by Bill Belichick. And then his argument was a what if. Moving the goalposts. His argument was, well, if Josh Allen was just 2% more accurate, the Bills win that game. Okay. 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 So you're saying if the quarterback throwing into an absolute monsoon was 2% more accurate, they win that game. That makes sense. But if, you know, I could also say if the the Patriots didn't run the balls effectively, they don't win that game. The Bills shouldn't win that game. But because the the Patriots did run the ball that effectively and did ha- come up with a fantastic game plan that you were trying to degrade because you hate Bill Belichick and you hate Mac Jones because Mac Jones was enemy number one to the media because he wasn't the flashy, sexiest pick, you have to make it seem dumb as to what they did, right? Well, Nick, who won the game? Which game plan worked, buddy? Because this is why you never will be a head coach. You never should be a head coach. And you should really stop talking about football. Just stick to talking about LeBron James. Because you don't really talk about basketball. You just talk about LeBron James. The Patriots came out and showed the Bills, hey, whatever weather at home or away, we could beat you. That's why I picked the, the Patriots to win this division two weeks ago. We could beat you. Home, away, raining, snowing, windy, sunshine, and rainbows. We can beat you. The Bills are in trouble, man. Like, the Bills and the Rams are the two teams that are in the most trouble, in my opinion. I think the Rams more so than the Bills. But the the Bills are in trouble. And the Patriots just showed that they are the best team in the AFC, and it's not even close. I'm taking this Patriots team over the Chiefs every single day of the week. Now, I could be wrong about that when it comes to playoffs because it's one and done. They don't play two times a year. But they've become a more aggressive offense. Now, it's funny that I'm saying that after they throw the ball three times. But, excuse me, in week 12, Mac Jones had the highest intended air yards of any, or highest attempted air yards of any quarterback in the NFL. They can run the ball at will. Their defense is lights out. And they're creating turnovers. So you tell me how this game is any different under any other circumstances. Because it's not. They, the, the Patriots have now swept the Bills. I think. Unless they play again. But 
I'm pretty confident they swept the Bills this year. I think they play one more time. So, Nick Wright, keep your trash takes, keep them in your head, and just talk about LeBron James. I'm just kidding. I, I feel really bad talking about Nick Wright like this because it ever comes if I ever do get famous and people do start listening to this podcast, they're going to pull up this clip. But no, I'm not sorry. Terrible take, Nick. Do better. Um, but anyway, guys, that was last game of the week. That is going to do it for this episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Please tune into our YouTube channel if you're listening on Spotify. And if you're listening on YouTube, go ahead and check out our Spotify. All the podcasts are out there. Um, but uh, basically, uh, if you're listening on Spotify, I really would encourage you to go check out our other content. Not because I put a lot of hard work into it, but because I think it's worth watching. I think especially the mock draft videos, those have gotten – a ton of like we're averaging like 70 comments per video over 4,000 views per video we are killing it with our, our our mock draft videos and uh check out our fantasy football content if you play fantasy football we used to do a fantasy football podcast along with the nfl coverage podcast but starting a new job it became a little bit too much so if you're listening on youtube please like comment subscribe if you're listening on spotify check us out on youtube check out our content recommend us to a friend and go ahead and be a be a be a lad and uh subscribe uh follow us on twitter at pylon underscore the and follow our Instagram at the underscore pylon underscore cam. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. And we will catch you in the next one. Peace.